For this year's Enduro Bike of the Year test, I went out and tested 10 different Enduro bikes. These ranged from bikes with 146mm to 170mm of travel, and the prices varied from £3,700 all the way up to £4,500. So after the many hours of back-to-back -back testing, I can now reveal the bike that came in third place, which was the Cube Stereo 170 SL 29er. While I did most of my testing here in the UK, riding some of the grottiest, wettest tracks possible, I spent loads of time on natural off-piste trails, which have a mix of roots and rocks. I also spent a lot of time at the bike park, in Bike Park Wells in fact, which has much higher speed, a nice consistent surface so I could carry on trying to ride fast even though it was really wet. And then we also went out to Spain where we were guided by the guys from Blacktown Trails. Now the terrain out there, well, for a start it was dry, which was brilliant for us, but it's a huge um, expanse of these granite boulders, a bit of loose soil in between, and then generally the speeds are just much higher and it was super fun and great to be out there. This is the third year I've done the Enduro Bike of the Year test, but if you're unfamiliar with the format, I'm going to first off start with the frame, just cover off a few details there, then go into a bit of detail around the spec, and then I'll talk about how the bike actually rides. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to see more independent reviews like this. While we've always included a Cube in the Enduro Bike category, they've never come in the top three. Thankfully this year, their new stereo has really, really impressed me. I'm going to start out talking about the frame first. Now, as you might guess by the name, the Stereo 170 has 170 mil of travel. That's delivered using a four bar uh, linkage back end, which is controlled using Fox's Float X2 rear shock, which has tons of really usable adjustment. But the thing with the Stereo is that it's not actually limited to the use of an air shock. Cube have been pretty smart here, and using a flip chip at the top of the shock mount, and at the bottom, two drillings for different shocks, you can actually switch between coil and air shocks. Now they've got two different mountings because um, Q wanted to have a different leverage curve dependent upon the shock so it can really make the most of how those different shocks perform. Uh, in this instance, okay, yeah, I've got the air shock and um, thankfully I had absolutely no problems with it and got it set up quite easily and found the sweet spot pretty quickly. That well-controlled 170mm of travel, courtesy of that Float X2 rear shock, coupled with the, I mean, it's not crazy geometry, but it's still really decent, all adds up to make the Cube one of the most fun bikes in this category. The 18 inch frame that I tested had a reach of 446 mil, which is by no means the craziest out there, but it's still really good. Now, if I wanted to upsize and get a bit more space in the frame, I'd have to go up to the 20 inch frame. But unfortunately, the 20 inch frame has a seat tube length of 470 mil. So Cube have made it so each frame upsizes by 50 mil in the seat tube, which does limit the chance to actually um, jump between sizes like you might be able to do on other bikes. While the reach might not be the craziest out there, its head tube angle is actually pretty slack at 64.4 degrees. Cube have worked with a company called Across to develop their own angled headset cups. Now these allow you to change the head angle by 0.4 degrees. Um, when you do change them, you can also then alter the BB height by 1.2 millimeters, and I think it changes the seat angle by about 0.2. So in its slackest setting at 64.4, it's actually you know, pretty slack compared to the rest of the competition out there, which is really good. At 435 mil long, the chain stay isn't by any means the longest on test, but it still feels long enough to add a bit of stability and it's short enough that it keeps things agile and playful, which again makes the Cube one of the most fun bikes on test. It's actually worth mentioning that Cube have gone pretty extreme with their seat angle though. Well, their effective seat angle, which measures in at 76.7 degrees. Um, it isn't the steepest out there, but it's still great to see companies like Cube go in that extra mile to make things feel a bit more efficient for the climbing. Moving on to the spec. If you look closely at the pivots, you'll see that Cube have actually gone the extra mile and they've concealed them as best they can just to help weatherproof them that bit further, which is ideal for riding in weather like we've had for the last five months where it just hasn't stopped raining. Now, the eagle-eyed amongst you would have noticed that the Cube is in fact aluminium. By using an aluminium frame, it's meant that Cube haven't had to spend all their money on carbon moulds and things like that, and they've been able to pack a ton of great draw-worthy kit all over the Stereo 170. 
That's why you can see the Kashima coated Fox suspension and dropper post, which is from their full factory range. The Fox 36 fork has all the adjustment you could possibly need and uses one of our preferred dampers in the Grip 2. Now, there's tons of adjustment, so alongside being able to tweak the volume of the air spring using the tokens that Fox provide, you can also change using the, the clickers on top and the bottom of the fork, uh, the low speed compression, the high speed compression, uh, the low speed rebound and the high speed rebound. It's a similar story with the Float X2 shock at the rear but it does differ very slightly. That's because on this particular model, there is a low speed compression lever which lets you firm up the shock for climbing. You also get high speed compression adjustment, low speed rebound and high speed rebound adjustment. And you can tweak the volume using the spaces that Fox supply. Shimano provide both the gears and the brakes and in this case, they're all from the XT range. It has the new 12 speed drivetrain, uh, which features their 10 to 51 tooth cassette, which is really wide. In terms of the braking, we're covered very well by the fact that Cube have spec'd Shimano's four piston XT brakes. In the past, we've had some issues with wandering bite points on the XT brakes. Uh, fortunately, this time around, we've had no such issues. It seems that these have got a really good bleed and things have been consistent, but I'll talk more about that later. Again, where you can see Cube have saved some money using an aluminium frame over a carbon frame is the fact that there's some carbon parts spec as standard as well. So you've got a carbon race face bar and crank, uh, unlike the other bikes in the top three of this category. What I would say in terms of the stereo's Achilles heel though, is their choice in tires. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of the Magic Mary that sits up front in its Addict soft grip, but the speed grip version of the hands damp that sits out the back does get pretty skatey in the wet. Again, I'm gonna talk more about that later, but suffice to say, an Endura bike with 170 mm travel that can be ridden very, very fast needs to have much tougher casing tires. So this aluminum frame and all these fancy parts add up to a build that weighs just 15.01 kilos, which isn't bad considering you've got 29 inch wheels and 170 mm of travel on tap. Now the first thing about how the Cube rides is the fact that it's easy to set up. Okay, it's got a lot of adjustment on the suspension front and rear, but it didn't take me long to get it dialed in um, and set pressures and sag. It was all pretty, pretty straightforward. And because the reach isn't crazy long, it doesn't mean that you have to adapt your riding style if you're coming off a more sort of traditional enduro style bike. So that meant it felt like I could ride fast and have fun straight away. The actual seated climbing position isn't too bad. The seat angle is relatively steep, so you feel nice and efficient with your hips over the bottom bracket, so you can spin quite easily. But what I would say is it's not particularly stretched out because the effective top tube is only 581 mil. When you compare it to something like the Specialized Enduro, which has an effective top tube of 619 mil, so it's quite a difference. So that means it's a little bit more cramped. As a result, when it gets really steep, you will find the front wheel lifting a little bit. I also found I wanted to reach for the low speed compression lever on the shock just to firm the back end up a little bit, just because on the high torque, slower, sort of steep pitches, it would squat a little bit under power. And so I just wanted to firm it up as much as I could just to make things a bit easier on me. But of course, a bike like this isn't designed just to go uphill. That's only part of the story here. Really, the focus has to be its downhill performance. And here, the cube doesn't disappoint. Now I've already mentioned how much fun I had riding this bike and that's just because it feels so light and poppy and so much fun to throw around. At times it almost feels like you're riding a lighter, more eager trail bike rather than a full-blown Enduro bike and it's not until you pummel into something awfully rocky and horrible that you realise that you've still got all that travel on tap which is really handy. When things do get rowdy, the suspension feels really well composed. Now, Fox has done a great job with the grip damper and the X2 shock, where it feels like they offer a really good balance of support when you need it, so when you're loading the bike and throwing it from turn to turn. But equally, as it does get rowdier, there feels like there's a good amount of comfort, so you get less through your hands and your feet and you don't get quite so beaten up on those longer runs. As the speeds pick up, the stereo feels stable and it feels like it can handle the high pace really well. 
but I would say that it maybe doesn't feel quite as sure-footed as some of the longer bikes on this test. That's not necessarily just because it's got a more reserved reach measurement, but I think more to do with the light casing on the tyres. So I've already mentioned this earlier, but the Schwalbe tyres use the snakeskin casing, which is relatively light and it's not too bad at resisting punctures. But a bike like this can be ridden ridiculously fast. And when you do get out of shape and you're pummeling through rock gardens and nasty jagged bits of root and whatever else might be in the way, these tyres just simply can't handle it. And it was one of the bikes that I did have the most flats on. Cube don't set it up tubeless as standard, so there are tubes in there, so you might want to just change those straight away. But personally, if it was me, I would also, at the minimum, switch the rear tyre and stick something with a heavier casing on. I'd also go for something with a tackier, softer rubber compound, just so it feels a little bit better damp. The hands damp isn't bad, but if it does get slightly damp out, it does mean that that speed grip casing can feel quite skittish. And while the rest of the bike seems to handle everything so well, it is a bit of a shame that you still need to change at least the rear tyre just to get around these issues. As I mentioned before, these XT4 piston brakes happen to have a really good bleed and we had no issues with the wandering bike point. Now, the feel at the lever is super light, yet as soon as those pads grip the rotor, the punch and the bite from these things is incredible. It may actually take a little bit of time just to get used to how grabby they are, but for me, I really liked just how punchy they felt and every time I got off this bike and switched to something else, the brakes felt somewhat of a letdown. So to conclude, I had a great time riding the Cube Stereo 170. It's a super fun bike to ride. It's really agile, it's great to throw around, and it feels brilliant on the trail, no matter what you're riding. Its suspension is really well balanced, and it's easy to set up to. And the geometry might not be crazy, but it is really easy to adapt to. Okay, maybe for the faster, rougher stuff, it feels like it could be stretched out a little bit more, just a slightly roomier reach, only a few mil, wouldn't take a lot really. The only other thing I think I'd change is, at the minimum, the rear tyre. If not, maybe both, just for something a bit tackier and with tougher casings, just because it feels like this bike's so capable of being ridden really fast, the tyres just can't handle the pace. So get rid of those, and it would be a serious contender for the win. At £4,099, the Cube Stereo sits roughly in the middle of our price bracket and because of the aluminium frame, it is covered in some of the nicest kit here. If a carbon frame isn't important to you, then this is a bike seriously worth considering. So what do you guys think of the new Cube 170? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like and subscribe and also click on the bell icon so you're always notified anytime we upload a new video. Thanks and goodbye.